it, it is July 1644. We are under close siege for my lord, the Marquis, and his army, the famous white coats, his tercio, so bold, so brave, are broken and bloodied on the field of Marston Moor. Scarce 30 men out of 3,000 survived. This young man was lucky. Until now, anyway. But I'm a surgeon. A master surgeon, I may say. And I belong to the august company of surgeons of the city of Newcastle. Town of Newcastle, you're not yet a city. Uh, that I hope that King Charles uh, may remember our sacrifice. There are 26 such companies or guilds in the country. And you may not practice medicine until you are recognized by the company as a master surgeon. I myself qualified many years ago. I have today with me my assistant. Now, some fellows would say you might as well teach a dog to be a surgeon as a woman. I disagree. A woman has many qualities and generally they work cheaper than their male equivalents. As you can see, these Scots are damn dead busy with their muskets, as this poor fellow has found out. I'll come to him. Now, as my assistant, she began as my apprentice. She was interviewed by the company and obliged to pay a fee, quite a generous fee actually, which her father met, to uh, accommodate the cost of her teaching, being taught by me. Now, I myself lecture regularly every Tuesday in peacetime in the Hall of Surgeons to my fellow surgeons and indeed some of those damned nosy physicians about matters of surgery. Our growing science coming daily more effective, daily more informed, and daily more and more scientific. Now, she has served her three years as my apprentice and has now moved up to being my assistant, where she may serve yet another three years. When I am satisfied that she has reached a level of competence, I will equip her with an end of time <coughs> report, a letter of recommendation. Then she will have to go before the company itself and be examined. She will be examined uh, both theoretically and practically. Her first demonstration, her first examination, in front of the uh, master surgeon of the company, will be a private affair, where she will demonstrate her capacity in surgery. She will have to prepare and use a lancet. Now, you see, this is a very fine instrument. I must apologize to all of you for the rather poor quality of the instruments I'm using today. Uh, we don't normally tell the patients, but my own fine instruments are in my equally fine house at the top end of the table, which thankfully is out of range of the Scots bombardment. The lancet is often fashioned by the surgeon himself. It must be sharpened, so sharp, and the assistant will demonstrate this that a piece of taut leather, it will go straight through, like a knife through butter, with no noise at all. That is how precise you must be, and indeed, we surgeons, some of the earlier surgeons, made their own tools. Now, my particular hero among surgeons is the great surgeon John Bradmore. Now, Bradmore was a surgeon and a jeweller. He was a metal worker, and indeed he was a counterfeiter. At the time of the Battle of Shrewsbury, 200 odd years ago, he was in jail uh, for fraud. However, in that battle, Prince Henry, Prince Hal, the future King of England, was injured by an arrow. No guns in those days. An arrow, a bodkin point, lodged in his face. Just to the side of the nose, just below the eye. And drove through six inches. So it was as close as you can manage in to the brainstem. One of his fellows, some bungling physician, tried to pull the arrow out, but just succeeded in snapping off the point, leaving the head of the arrow in the wound. This was somewhat painful for his highness. Though being a man, an Englishman, and a man of fine blood, he uttered no comment at all, probably because he was unconscious. Bradmore was summoned because it was recognised that he was the greatest surgeon of his day. Seeing the nature of the wound, he devised a specific tool. Now, this tool was like a pair of forceps within a pair of pliers and threaded with a handle. So he inserted the tube into the wound, having had honey poured in first, which has qualities of healing, and he was able to locate the socket of the device onto the stub of the arrow. He then screwed the screw into the timber stub of the arrow and extracted it using the arms to do so. A fairly painful process, but effective. The wound was then cleaned, cleaned out with wine, and sealed with cobwebs. Of course, as everybody knows, will help to bind the wound. And the patient made a full recovery, and indeed went on to give the French a fearful bashing. Now, 
We haven't seen many arrow wounds in this war. I believe the Scots still use burn arrows, why not? But I'm familiar with the works of a chap called Ambrose Parry. Now, people say, why would you read Parry? He's a Frenchman. But nonetheless, he knew a lot about bullet wounds, because these are the kind of wounds we have to deal with today. Soft lead bullets, which mangle the flesh most horribly and will shear off a limb if they are flattened through the air. My own particular favourite amongst medical writers is John Woodall. Now, Woodall wrote The Surgeon's Mate, who I think it was in 1628, what, uh, 15 years ago. It's a step-by-step -step guide, a practical man's guide uh, to surgery. Now, there's some debate between physicians and surgeons as to who takes precedence. Physicians are strange fellows, very prickly, and it's the job of the physician to diagnose the ill of the patient. So he works out what is wrong with the patient uh, from what the patient tells him and what physical symptoms he can find and discover. It is then the job of the surgeon to put that right. Now in war, of course, things change. In war, it's pretty, obviously what, right, it's pretty obvious what is wrong with your patient. He's had his leg shot off or he's been hacked with a sword. So the work of the physician is far less important than the work of the surgeon. And those who march with the army are all surgeons, generally not that many physicians. Now, every company of foot normally has its own surgeon, if the colonel can afford it. The surgeon is paid at the same rate as an armourer. That's about two shillings and six pence every month. Now, the soldier himself has tuppence a month deducted from his wages in order to cover the cost of medications and bandages to stock the company medicine chest. And the surgeon may make allowance from that. Some surgeons myself included, those who serve the higher gentry, of course, those who treat persons of quality, uh, can command far higher fees. Now, since the Marquis of Newcastle is no longer with us, since he has, unfortunately, left for the continent after the wreck of his army at Marsden Moor, I serve Sir John Marley. Now, Sir John Marley is the mayor of Newcastle. He is charged with the defence of our city, so closely beset by these rebellious Scotsmen. And day upon day, wounds and injuries are brought into me. Now, here today, we have this fine young fellow, a member of the garrison, a stout fellow, survived the Battle of Marsden Moor, was in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Scots upon the wall as they tried to make an escalade, and won with a musket butt, smashed, yet, uh, yes, oh, alcohol, yes, that's good, thank you very much. Ooh, alcohol can be used for pain relief smashed him across the skull with a musket butt, causing a depressed fracture, which may be quite painful, of course. It is my job to rectify the injury. If he is not treated, then the broken bone will press upon the brain and he will most certainly expire. Now, there's a lot we hear these days about bedside manner. I treat my patients frankly. I am honest with them. It means their family can't sue me if he dies. I will tell him. No sweet tales, no sweet lies, I will tell him. This will hurt. You may die. That's enough of the bedside manner. Pain relief, we do not believe in. I'm an old-fashioned kind of surgeon. Pain is good. The man must shout out. His spirit must breathe. Because we deal not just with the physical, but also with the spiritual. The nature of the man's soul, how he deals with the injury nature has chosen to inflict upon him, is of prime importance in his cure. I, I, his cure. I hope he will be cured. Now, we will look at the range of instruments I have to assist me. Can you kindly, my dear, pass me the incision knife, that bone-handled incision knife? Uh, not that. No, that's a razor. She has to have a bit to learn. This is the incision knife. Now, this is, generally speaking, thin-bladed, sharp. Not as sharp as a razor, perhaps, nor as thin blade. This is what we use for making the incision. That is the first cut, which has to be done with delicacy. Generally, we would prefer to cut along the muscle rather than across it. I hope you'll take notice of that, because that will do less long-term damage. And uh, Normally, um, Tyndall rec Woodall recommends we have at least a couple of these and keep them sharp. The other thing we need, of course, is a sharpening stone. Everybody forgets that the instruments must be kept sharp. A blunt instrument is of no good to anyone. Now, if you would kindly pass me uh, the dismembering knife. That one. Uh, it's a bit of a force to call it a dismembering knife, but basically that's what it will do. We use this to cut through flesh and sinew, to cut down, if necessary, to the bone before we perform an amputation. 
These are always essential and again must be kept razor sharp. Will you kindly pass me the razor, my dear? Now this, as you recognise, is a common barber's tool. Indeed, of course, many surgeons are also barbers. Um, yeah, I may give him a shave when I'm finished. The razor, by its name, is razor razor. I will use that, after I've cut away his hair over the injury, to pare back the stubble to expose the skull. Don't worry, I haven't started yet. Pare back to expose the area of skull which has been damaged. So I can see clearly that area which has been affected by the blow. But I have many other instruments. If you would kindly pass me um, the bill, please. That here. Now these are called bills. Uh, because you see, they're a bit like a duck's bill, or so they say. And these are tools, or is a tool, uh, which I will use to fish around in a wound to remove extraneous matter. If a piece of bone, a piece of wood, or cloth has been driven into the wound, I'll attempt to extract it with this. I may also try and remove a bullet, if there is a bullet in the wound somewhere. Now, the bullets are tricky. Bullet is lead, of course, very easy to cause infection. And if the bullet is embedded in the bone, if it's stuck fast, well, often, it's as well to leave it. If I have to mess around, could you pass me the hook, please? In order to help me extract the bullet, I will use the hook to pull aside arteries and ligament to gain access to the wound. And then I can use the spatula at end to apply salve and medicine. These, are, these tools are made mainly in the Low Countries, or Germany at the moment. They're of average manufacture. But again, in war, um, you don't really want to use your best tools. Thank you, my dear. If you would kindly pass me now, I think you would pass me the needle, if you would. Now, obviously, I'll come to suturing. You may have to suture, that is to stitch up a wound. Sailmaker's needles, which will pierce leather, are very useful for this. Now, some will have them case-hardened by a blacksmith. Not I. That is not the way to do it. It is not fine enough. I suggest you wrap the tip of the needle in best brown paper, and then you case-harden it over a candle flame. Candles are very useful. You always have to have candles with you. And that gives it just the right level of hardness and sharpness in order to be able to suture. Now, thread. Thread is important. Remember, we are not just craftsmen. We are not just artists. We are also tradesmen to a degree. Now, I find that white or red thread is generally best. The black thread is poor. It, it, it is not reliable. Some will use silk, but silk... Silk, in some ways, is too strong. It will cut the edges of a wound if you bind the wound with silk. I think Dutch white hemp is by far the best thread to use, and that is what I tend to use in all of my operations. And, of course, we have a whole gamut of other tools. We have water. We have alcohol for the surgeon, mainly. We have flat knives, in which we use for applying salves. And bandage. We have bandages. We have clouts, cloths for mopping up. We have bags to put... Um, amputated limbs in, so they don't distress the other patients. And we have a whole... Ra oh, yes, thank you very much. Excellent. Mm. Absolutely first class. And so now, uh, madam, drink is for the master, not the servant. So, here we have this patient who has this terrible wound upon his skull. My dear, might you be kind enough just to restrain the patient as he tries to escape? And I'll begin. Firstly, I will use scissors to cut away his rather fine hair. Of course, it'll grow back if he lives. And then the razor to pare down to the bone. So I'll have exposed the area of bone which has been damaged, uh, which, of course, is pressing on his brain, which may cause him some discomfort. No, indeed, he may not even feel it. Unless he's treated, those splinters of bone will be the death of him. So, this is the bit... You might want your eyes bound or your ears bound up for this. I have a drill, a bit like a carpenter's drill, which has a wide bit, English made, not this cheap German rubbish. And I use that, the noise often upsets patients, and of course the heat and the grinding bone. And I grind and I drill out the section of bone which has been shattered. So therefore there is a, effectively, a hole in the patient's skull. Then you'll be able to see his brain now palpitating freely beneath it. I will then have a disc, a fine disc, silver if he's a gentleman, copper if he's a commoner, which I will place into the open circular wound. The flaps of skin, which I have pared away uh, with my lancet, I will then cover back over the wound and stitch it up neatly. Neat, small stitches. Sometimes I will allow the assistant to do that. It's good training and it's fine. You feeling all right? He looks a bit green to me, actually. Never mind. Uh, and most of my patients survive, I have to say. I've done many a trepan.
It gets more complex and happily this patient is not suffering from any serious wounds to the limbs, as far as we can see, that would require amputation. Now, if he has a finger which has been damaged beyond repair, I'll just simply lop it off using a chisel, put him on the table, bang with a wooden mallet, run through the thing. Well, I don't anyway, he'd scream a bit. If, however, he has a serious wound to his lower limbs, let us say, then I'd probably require the service of more than one assistant. One, as you've just seen, to hold him back into the chair, in case he squirms about. Another, who will, we will cut away his breeches to expose the air which is affected. Let us say he's been hit in the knee, very painful. One assistant will pull back the skin on his thigh, steady on, so it's taut. And they will tie that off with a ligature. That will stop the blood, of course, flowing too freely and also keep the tautness in the skin. So one assistant will hold him like so. I will then use... Uh, this knife, the dismembering knife, to cut away the flesh around the wound. Once I have exposed the cartilage, I will then cut through that using the incision knife. Once I've done that and it's exposed, another assistant will hold the affected limb and just bend it slightly so the saw will work more effectively. And this is the bit you really want your patient perhaps not to see. This is the bone saw. Nice piece of kit, if you look after it, it'll last you a lifetime. And I will saw swiftly through the bone. Again, the noise is quite distressing for patients. And then I will seal off the wound uh, with a cauterizing iron. Now, we use irons a lot in war because, of course, it is necessary to treat these injuries as quickly as possible. The ancient Roman uh, physician, Galen, uh, whose works we still read today, told us that it was best to treat the injured soldier as close to the battlefield and as soon or as soon after as possible after he had been injured. So the shock which the body suffers will be such uh, that it will act as an anaesthetic. It will effectively provide, the body will provide its own pain relief. Quite remarkable. We generally don't provide uh, pain relief. Though we might give a bit of poppy juice on a sponge if he's screaming an awful lot. But we just expect to take it like a man. And then he can, well... Hobble off really, can't he? Well, you normally put him to bed. Uh, you should always have amongst your kit a bedpan and a close stool because uh, some patients you will find their bowels do tend to move in these circumstances. And uh, it's always handy to have a close stool anyway, just in case you're, you're caught short. Now, this all sounds a bit crude. And to be fair, the mortality rate among patients can be quite high. The thing is, I'll try and save the limb, of course. But once putrefaction sets in, well, then we have no choice but to amputate. Or if the limb itself is so badly damaged that it cannot be of any use to him, then it's best <coughs> to take it off quick and clean. But, in terms of a general diagnosis, <coughs> I might think this man is suffering from an ill humour. Now, of course, we all know the body is governed by humours, carried by the blood. Phlegm, melancholy, choler. Choler. Now, I've known if he was choleric. Young man, do you feel hot? Do you feel warm? No. He doesn't feel warm. Yet he may, I don't know, he has a slightly, he looks slightly red in the face, a little red in the face, I think, yes. Uh, red in the face. Do you perspire uh, a lot when you... Uh, he perspires quite a lot. Do you, at night, do you have certain vivid dreams concerning women I at night? Done, yes. yes, there you go, see. Uh, thank God it's not men, at least. Um, yes, and therefore what we'll have to do, there's something which the assistant is well trained to do, is a little touch of phlebotomy. That's bloodletting. Now, it's good, honestly good for the patient. Um, here we have a, a bowl, and here we have a lancet. Now, the lancet must be sharp, and normally it is held between the thumb and forefinger so, to make a very neat incision. Because what I will do, I will roll up the patient's sleeve, I'll use my thumbs to pinch the arm, to bring the vein to the surface, and then just insert the merest nick allow the blood to flow freely into the bowl. Of course, I will judge when he's bled sufficiently. If he's indeed choleric, if the blood is pulsing too fast, if his urine is thick and red. Is your urine thick and red? Not that I remember. Mm, still, I think we'll be the judge of that. And then I'll judge when the flow of blood uh, is sufficient. Uh, best not to look, actually, it's always a bit distressing. And then I'll, um, I'll suture him up. Now, stitching, I guess, I mean, stitching is a delicate matter. I have mentioned the type of thread that we use, and we like to allow a wound to proceed 
on the basis of what we call first intentions. That is, let the body heal itself. Well, in times of peace, that's all very well. In times of war, the wounds which have been inflicted are so severe, there's no question of them healing themselves. Generally, your patient will bleed to death unless you act quickly. Therefore, stitching, neat stitching or suturing, is essential to keep the wound closed. We have another remedy as well, uh, one of which um, I have some doubt about, which is called uh, powdering or proofing the weapon. If you can get the weapon which has injured the man, you can create a powder to proof the wound and the weapon, a kind of holistic approach. The trouble is you need the seed from a, a rutting boar or bear at the time, or hair from a dead man's head. Uh, quite easy, well, there's obviously a lot of dead people lying around. I mean, put them outside, obviously, because it does disturb the patient slightly. And... Uh, uh, they tell me it's effective. That in times of war, one doesn't really have too much time to uh, proceed with the niceties. Now, you might think this surgery business is all about blood, but it's also about how we heal the patient, how we look at the patient. Physicians will get annoyed because they think I'm trespassing on their precious turf. But the fact is, we surgeons have to judge the well-being of our patient before we operate. And, of course, we do use some fine herbs for that, do we not, mistress? So another thing that we can use is herbal remedies and this is more, this is more to add the healing than the, the immediate effects of, uh, of injuries. We've already mentioned the use of honey and honey is fantastic. It's, honey can be used on just about anything. It does seem to stop any sort of infection setting in. Um, I use it myself when I've, if, I, if I've burnt myself in the kitchen. So anything like that, it's also very good for soothing a, a troubled stomach. How is your stomach, dear chap? A bit sore. It's a bit sore. Yes. Well, a little bit of mead should fix that. So which, there, you've got the honey and you've got the alcohol, which is extremely good. Yes. So, I mean, as far as other herbs go, anything that smells good, anything that smells good will drive out bad humours. Rose petals are good for pretty much anything. Again, it does seem to stop infection setting in. Um, one thing that I have used is rose water when petals are soaked in that, and you know that's very good for flushing out wounds. Something like rosemary. If rosemary is good for remembrance, if. You're a little bit fuzzy headed. Have you been there fuzzy headed at all? Uh, yes, very. Well, very fuzzy headed. When I make this lunch later, I'll put a little bit of rosemary in it. The oils in that are actually very good for clearing the mind, helping the memory come back. Now, wormwood's an interesting one. Wormwood's something that I would more use, not, not so much in an acute battle situation. It drives out worms. At the opposite end of the scale, anything that smells pleasant, smells sweet, is very good for bringing sweetness in. Bring it, make it everything good. But then something that smells bad can often be used to drive out bad. If you've got a bad smell, you want to step away from it. I know you said your stomach was a little unsettled, dear. So wormwood can smell a little bit iffy, but it does drive out worms because the worms think it smells a bit as iffy as we do. I would use that for toothache. I would use that for digestive worms. I would use it if you had a bit of a dodgy wound that had things crawling in it. The other things crawling in it just seems to clean it, which is quite mm. remarkable. It also sometimes it, it goes in a drink, but then you end up saying funny things. Let's not talk about that. Psychotropic hallucinogenic. No, no, no. I did have to practice. <laughs> So we, we, use, we use a lot of herbs sympathetically.